Major financial institutions have teetered on the edge of collapse, and some have failed. As uncertainty has grown, many banks have restricted lending, credit markets have frozen, and families and businesses have found it harder to borrow money. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis, and the federal government is responding with decisive action. So I propose that the federal government reduce the risk posed by these troubled assets and supply urgently needed money so banks and other financial institutions can avoid collapse and resume lending. This rescue effort is not aimed at preserving any individual company or industry. It is aimed at preserving America's overall economy. In January issue, the bailout was far bigger than the Federal Reserve let the public or even members of Congress know at the time. During the 2008 meltdown when the government bailed out too big to fail giants like Bear Stearns, AIG, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, who did they hire to analyze and clean up the mess? another giant financial firm by the name of BlackRock, led by a very well-connected billionaire by the name of Larry Fink. BlackRock was awarded these key government contracts to help with the meltdown with no competitive bidding while being enveloped in secrecy. Basically, Larry Fink was hired to be the manager of Washington's bailout of Wall Street, even though BlackRock is one of the biggest shareholders in the same banks they were helping to get bailed out, making Larry Fink the most powerful man in the post-bailout economy. Fast forward to the 2020 pandemic, Rick, quick question for you, sir. All We're right. just getting word from the Federal Reserve, and this might be boosting the markets uh, even more this afternoon. They are talking about the details of their corporate bond purchases. And the Fed making history today and for the first time ever began buying corporate debt ETFs. The unprecedented move driving an explosion in the corporate debt market. We are committed to using our full range of tools to support the economy and to help assure that the recovery from this difficult period will be as robust as possible. But again, as I mentioned, the Fed two weeks ago began buying individual corporate bonds, and we just got granular detail about what types of purchases it made yesterday. And who did the money printer of the US, the Federal Reserve, hire to manage their scheme to buy corporate bonds? Basically, they were bailing out corporations that had too much debt to withstand the pandemic. You guessed it, they went right back to BlackRock. Even though, again, the same corporations BlackRock was helping to bail out were the same corporations that they own some of the biggest stakes in. Keep in mind, though, these are just the top 10 holdings. The whole list, which the Fed has published on the New York Fed website, includes 794 companies. So yes, these are just the top 10 by holdings, but there are hundreds of other companies that could be part of the Fed's portfolio as well. Larry Fink was the most powerful man in the post-bailout economy, and now he's arguably one of the most powerful men in the post-pandemic economy as well. And yet, despite all his considerable power, the general public has practically never heard of Larry Fink, with BlackRock barely coming into the public eye during the recent claims that they were buying up single-family homes. That's because Larry is smart. He's intentionally kept it that way. He spent the last 33 years building BlackRock into the biggest asset manager in the world, with over $9 trillion under their management. Not billion, trillion with a T. Today, BlackRock's clients include the retirement accounts of average everyday people in the form of pension funds. They also have sovereign wealth funds as their clients, other central banks, college endowments, Fortune 500 companies, and millions of individual investors. They're one of the top shareholders of many of the biggest publicly traded companies like Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, and even other major banks like Wells Fargo and Chase. And to put their $9 trillion into perspective, the 300 largest pension funds in the world only hold a collective $6 trillion. Vanguard, the behemoth behind mutual funds and ETFs, trails behind BlackRock with only $7.1 trillion under management. And if you put the big three asset management firms together, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, they control a collective $15 trillion, roughly equivalent to nearly 70% of the US's GDP. And Larry Fink has done all of this largely in the shadows, with just a few occasional interviews and appearances on CNBC. He's like the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain. As William Cohen puts it, a former investment banker and author of House of Cards, an account of the Bear Stearns collapse. This is BlackRock. What some call the most influential financial institution in the world, the world's largest shadow bank, and perhaps the company that owns the world. When Larry Fink was asked by Bloomberg if it's true that he's the most powerful man in finance, the man responsible for $9 trillion tried to convince you otherwise. That quote, I don't think of myself as powerful, end quote. Is that true? Does BlackRock own the world? Well, it's a little bit complicated. BlackRock boasts some impressive stats. In 2010, they were called the most influential financial institution in the world. And in 2014, they had $4 trillion under management, making them the world's biggest asset manager. For comparison, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China only had $3 trillion at that time. 
And as I just mentioned, their assets have doubled to more than $9 trillion over the past seven years. It seems BlackRock has a hand in nearly everything these days. They're a top shareholder in some of the world's biggest publicly traded companies, a top shareholder of banks like Deutsche Bank at 4.81%. In 2020, they were approved by the Chinese government to set up a mutual fund in China, making BlackRock the first foreign asset manager to be greenlighted for this. They also have shares in companies all over Europe, including industries like energy, oil and gas, transportation, food, and of course, finance. And here's the kicker. BlackRock has what's called circular ownership, where they own shares in companies that own shares in BlackRock. Definitely not a conflict of interest. So they're literally everywhere. Because of their staggering size and power and the fact that they largely operate out of sight, BlackRock has been called the world's largest shadow bank. The question is, what makes someone build something this big? Larry Fink is known as the guy who always wanted more than he had friends have called him obsessive, paranoid about maintaining control, he's been regarded as someone who knows the markets inside and out and understands business backwards and forwards. But it took him a massive $100 million loss to get to this point. Larry majored in political science at UCLA and got his start on Wall Street at age 23. Having that edge in politics would later play a crucial role in him being the de facto middleman between Washington and Wall Street. He received offers from some of the top investment banks, but decided on First Boston, where he worked on structuring and trading bonds, which sounds incredibly interesting. He rose up the ranks quickly and within a decade, he became somewhat of a legend on Wall Street by helping develop the debt securitization market, where loans like car loans, credit card loans, mortgages would be bundled together, sliced into pieces, and sold to other investors. If this sounds familiar, it's because these are the same mortgage-backed securities that led to the 2008 meltdown. But before that happened, this securitization of debt was considered really innovative, and it transformed the face of finance. All of a sudden, if you're a giant bank or pension fund or whatever that wants to invest in the housing market, you can now invest in a mortgage-backed security made up of thousands of hopefully safe loans. Larry Fink created one of the main tools that led to the meltdown, and he was also the one the US Treasury hired to clean it up. His interest in policy and strategic wizardry helped him gain a reputation as a true investment mastermind. And for that, he was rewarded. Larry was making bank and received a ton of accolades. At just 31, he became First Boston's youngest managing director in history. Many even thought he would go to run the firm someday. In total, he helped add about a billion dollars in assets to First Boston's bottom line. But then, the rising star came crashing down. Shortly after one of his biggest wins, Larry lost $100 million for his company. A missed call on his hand resulted in trades being wiped out, as well as the hedges designed to offset those losses being wiped out. And overnight, Larry went from a hero to a toxic asset that should be avoided at all times. He was ostracized, his reputation went up in flames, and his colleagues wanted nothing to do with him. He was forced out of the company he spent 12 years making around a billion dollars for. While a catastrophe like this might mark the end for many people, that wasn't the case with Larry. Instead, he used it as ammunition, vowing to never find himself in a position where he didn't understand the risk he was taking again. And in 1988, he was 35 and hell-bent on rebooting his career. So Larry co-founded the Blackstone Group, along with now billionaire investor Steven Schwartzman. They started off with a $5 million line of credit. Fast forward to 1993, and they were crushing it with $20 billion under management. But in what some would call a power struggle between Fink and Schwartzman, where two super strong personalities collided, the two parted ways and Larry broke off to found BlackRock, channeling all his pain and trauma into growing the firm at a staggering rate. By 1999, it went public for $375 million. By 2004, it merged with Merrill Lynch, adding half a trillion dollars to BlackRock's assets. And today, it's at $9 trillion. While the size of BlackRock is impressive, what really sets them apart is their software platform called Aladdin, basically a supercomputer they use for their clients. Aladdin is a network of 5,000 computers BlackRock uses to monitor millions of trades and analyze their clients' portfolios 24 hours a day to perform risk analysis. Aladdin is so widespread today that it's basically the central nervous system for many of the largest players in the investment management industry. And for them to be able to offer the service, they have to be granted access to sensitive data from banks, insurance companies, pension funds, and other important institutions all over the world. This high-end computer farm literally goes over every possible scenario and pinpoints anything that could possibly go wrong, allowing their clients to make the best investment decisions. And it's through Aladdin that BlackRock actually oversees more like $21 trillion worth of assets instead of just $9 trillion. And that's just from a third of Aladdin's 240 clients. Which means that one company, BlackRock, has an eye on the equivalent of at least 10% of all the stocks and bonds in the world. In 2008, the world enters a global financial crisis that hasn't been seen since the Great Depression and Wall Street needs Washington to bail them out. Who do they call to manage the bailout? As you already know, BlackRock. 
The New York Fed personally went to Larry to help manage $30 billion in toxic assets from Bear Stearns. They brought BlackRock in to advise them on how to handle the $100 billion of toxic assets from AIG. They even contracted BlackRock to deal with the $301 billion of Citigroup's assets, all of which were done behind closed doors with no competitive bidding. And just like that, Larry was more powerful than ever. He went from being the laughingstock of finance to being the linchpin between Wall Street and Washington. As one bank executive said, Larry has always wanted to be important, and now he's more important than he ever dreamed of, and he's loving it. In the end, they made at least $200 million off of these contracts in total. The massive size of these contracts and the secrecy surrounding them, and BlackRock's enormous influence started getting people talking. Quote, it's like the black water of finance, almost a shadow government. Blackwater as in the most infamous private military contractor during the war on terror. Check out our mini documentary on them to learn more, link below. Now on the surface, this may sound bad, this may sound pretty shady and corrupt. But if you think about it, if the government is going to step in, which they are even though I don't completely agree with that, what else are they going to do? They're at least partially responsible for this mess for setting such low interest rates, so they're obviously already incompetent. They're not experts in things like mortgage-backed securities, so why wouldn't they go to the man that is an expert that helped pioneer these things in the first place? I'm not saying it isn't shady and corrupt, I'm just saying that giving these million dollar contracts to a man like Larry Fink is understandable. And it didn't stop there. When the you-know-what hit the fan in March 2020 with COVID, BlackRock came to the rescue for both Wall Street and the government again. The Federal Reserve hired them to help bail out corporations with too much debt or that needed to borrow money to stay afloat, which again included corporations they have huge stakes in, which is again, definitely not a conflict of interest. They also helped the Fed purchase more mortgage-backed securities on top of that. So where does BlackRock go moving forward? What does a man do when he already has everything? In 2019, people were petitioning against BlackRock for being among the top shareholders for oil and coal production. In fact, investing in heavy pollution industries has basically been the backbone of BlackRock's portfolio over the years. So according to Larry, they're making a push towards environmental, social, and sustainable investing. Whether or not they actually believe in this stuff is yet to be known. Nevertheless, it does appear they've made legit efforts to expand into this more eco-friendly market. With new environmentally focused products, they've partnered with activist investors, they backed a shareholder resolution basically forcing ExxonMobil to get serious about climate climate change, Larry even straight up wrote a letter telling companies that they need to, quote, contribute to society to receive his firm's support. This new push for sustainable investing or ESG investing is a big reason why you see so many corporations trying to appear woke these days. If you want to invest in a company, they will, on their investor relations page, they'll show you their ESG score. ESG stands for Environmental Social Corporate Governance. And this is where the woke culture comes from. So they've created this kind of phony baloney rating system that says, well, if you, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but if you mention that you are, you know, uh, have a green agenda and you, and you believe in carbon credits and you might trade some credit somewhere, then you get a higher score and therefore you're more investable. And it's very interesting to see how big investors like insurance company, institutional investors, they are steering away from anything that does not have the right ESG rating. And so in order to uh, have investors continue to be interested in the stock, which is important for the company, for its perception, certainly for the uh, the officers of the company and the shareholders, uh, you have to move this, move this along continuously. And so it's very simple to see why doing a woke ad as Nike or as any other company, um, and, and uh, Pride Month is fantastic because you could I and mean, pride is easy throw up some flags show the right people trans right, whatever right. and you got a high esg score the main catalyst for larry's success is the soul crushing humiliation he experienced after losing 100 million dollars that's what really catapulted blackrock into what it is today he put his entire being into the company and most people agree that he's still as driven as ever today when asked on a personal level what's important this is what he had to say this may sound trite, but it's really important for me to be perceived as a good human being, a caring individual that always comes across as real and unpretentious. And one thing I tell everybody, you may not be able to print this, is that I'm the same turd I was 30 years ago, and I'm really proud of that. If there is indeed an American oligarchy today, Larry Fink would definitely be one of them. But is he a good oligarch or a bad one? Are they just putting on a show to keep the public at bay? How influential is BlackRock really? How much control over the world do they really have? Let me know what you think in the comments below.